Praise God. You can be seated this morning. Amen. Man, isn't it good to be in the house of God today? Praise God. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And uh, each year, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, I like to talk about Thanksgiving it because it's, it's one of those subjects that you can really never hear enough of. Uh, it doesn't matter how thankful of a person you are. It's something you need to be reminded about regularly, especially uh, especially when you live in a country like we live in, a nation like we live in, where we're so blessed and we're so provided for and we have so many things that the, the rest of the world does not have. It's very easy to kind of become numb to the blessings that we walk in every day. It's very easy to become ungrateful and unthankful for all the things that we walk in. Any of you that have children know what I'm talking about because it's difficult to instill that in them on a regular basis. I I know my kids, for one, have no idea how good they have it, and they're good kids, you know, and and we tell them a lot, but it doesn't matter. They still don't really get it. It's just part of the human condition, unfortunately, is part of the human condition is to get used to your blessings and then become unthankful. It's very... Sad, but it's true. And so you have to be intentional about it. You have to be intentional. If you're going to walk around with gratitude and thankfulness in your heart for your spouse, for your kids, for your job, for your church, for your health, if you're going to walk in thankfulness, it's going to be because you cultivated it and it's going to be because you did it on purpose. Because I can tell you, if you're just in cruise control and you're, you're not actively pursuing it, you're going to find yourself complaining being bitter, gossiping, talking about things you shouldn't be talking about. And it's because that, that thankfulness is not cultivated. God knew this about us, which is why throughout the Old Testament, he would implement these different feasts and these different celebrations. All of them had to do with remembrance. Every one of them had to do with it. When you would, when you would read, uh, for example, the Passover, it was all about remembering what God did in delivering them from Exodus. That was why he instituted the, the Passover. It's so that you'd never forget it. Every year you'd celebrate it and it would cause your heart to be thankful and you'd go, man, I remember when God brought us out of Egypt. And even if you weren't there when he brought you out and maybe you were the grandkids or the great grandkids of one that was brought out, you'd celebrate the Passover and they'd retell the story and thankfulness would come up in their heart. They'd go, man, I'm so glad God delivered my grandfather out of that. Man, we serve a good God. The whole idea is that remembrance would be stoked. The fires of thankfulness, remembrance would, would stoke the fires of thankfulness in our heart. So 1 Timothy chapter 6 is where I want to start this morning. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of it. How many know that statement right there is a good one, just to kind of remember, maybe write it on your refrigerator, put it there? Uh, you know, no matter how much you acquire in this world, okay, no matter how big your pile of stuff is compared to mine, neither of us are taking anything out of this world. You didn't come in with anything. And you're not taking anything out. So no matter what you acquire, and not necessarily wrong with acquiring things, but just no matter the things that you acquire, just understand it's very short-lived. And it's all staying behind. And when you leave, you can't take any of it with you. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, I want to pause right here. If I asked the question, if I had asked you the question before we read this passage, I might would have got a different response. But if I asked you the question, how many of you desire to be rich? Just raise your hand. Because let's be honest, I mean, that's in all of us, right? And you go, we just would put a different term on it. We wouldn't say rich because I just read the scripture. Say, no, I don't, desire, I don't want to need to be rich, you know. I just want to be a little bit further than I am right now. You know, I just want to have a little bit more than I have right now. Do you know it doesn't matter how much money you have, everybody feels that way? You go, oh, no, surely the people that have got millions and billions, that they, they, they want to, you know, they're happy with where they're at, right? Wrong. Actually, they did, a, they did a study on this very thing. They did a study on rich people and all different levels of rich people, 
And the overall results of the study was that every person that they talked to, the, the conclusion was is that they wanted that. They, they actually asked them this question. They said, what, how much money would it take for you to be happy? And the overall consensus was that everyone said, no matter how much money they had, they said, I would like to have about three to four times of what I have right now. And it didn't matter how much money they had. That was the answer. And I, you know, hey, I, I may, if they'd asked me, I probably said the same thing. You know, I could, I would love to have three or four times the money I have right now. How, who wouldn't, right? But here's what his, here's his point. Notice what he says. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Here's what he's saying. You have to be careful about that desire to be rich because that desire can drive you to build your life in such a way that you miss God. That desire to have money can be so great that it's greater than your desire to please and obey God. That desire to be rich, if you're not careful, can affect your choices in such a way that when you come to a, a fork in the road and you ought to go with God, you go with what's more financially beneficial for you instead. That's why he's saying this. See, see what, when Jesus said it in the Gospels, he said you can't serve God and money. They're both, they're both trying to be masters in your life and you can't serve both. So what happens is many times, what happens when you have two masters? Well, you always come to that point where master A wants to do one thing and this other one wants to do this one. And you have to decide, who am I going to go with? Who am I submitted to? Who am I under? Who's the real Lord of my life? And if Jesus is not the Lord, and that desire to be rich can cause you to pursue that instead of pursuing God. This is what Paul understood so he said right here, those who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation. In other words, that desire to be rich is a snare in your life that Satan can constantly tempt you with. He, it's an open door in your life where Satan can constantly put things in front of you to trip you up. Now, today we're talking about, you know, we'll talk some about finances, we'll talk about other things. But let me just say this, any inappropriate desire in your life. Any desire in your life that shouldn't be there is an open door for the enemy to tempt you in that area. I mean, I've seen this with single people that they desire to be married. Everybody desires to be married. You know, a lot of people desire to be married. Nothing wrong with that. But I've seen where that desire begins to consume their life. And so instead of following God and letting that be the thing that consumes their life, they just, all they can focus, so that desire to be married is just, it's consuming their mind and their thoughts. And so before you know it, they'll be with anybody, even if they're not a Christian. They'll be with anybody, even if it's out of the will of God. So what happens is that desire, Satan knows it, and so he uses that desire to tempt and to come at you. What is he doing? He's trying to trip you up. He's trying to get you off, and he comes at that inappropriate desire. Actually, the word in Scripture for inappropriate desire is actually the word lust. It's to lust after something. That, it's to desire something that you really have no business desiring. So, verse 9, he says, But those who desire to be rich, so that desire to be rich is something Satan uses to tempt. The desire to be rich, to fall into temptation, he said they fall into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So this is, this is very powerful, verse 10. He makes it clear that this craving and this desire is so powerful that it can affect your relationship with God. It can affect, actually, he says some have wandered away from the faith as a result of it. Now let me ask you a question. Does Paul the Apostle know what he's talking about? Or is he just off base on this? Does he not really understand what he's talking about. Does, does he, is he mistaken? Can we actually uh, coexist in our Christianity with pursuing stuff, pursuing, pursuing wealth, making that the aim and the goal of our life, but also we can still pursue God and love God and go after that? And I understand that 
we all have jobs and we all have occupations and we, we go to those things every day and we do them and we make money and that's how we live. I get all of that. I don't think he's against that at all. But when he, what he's talking about is when you're comparing the two, when you're comparing your desire to be rich with your desire for God, when you're, comparing, when you're comparing your pursuit of wealth with your pursuit of God, what does it look like? Can you look at them and not really tell the difference? Is it just about the same? Or does it obviously far outweigh it that any time I've got to choose between money, any time I've got to choose between wealth, any time I've got to choose between stuff and God, I'm always choosing God. Matter of fact, I don't care if it costs me stuff, if it costs me money, if it costs me status, if it costs me influence, it doesn't matter. I'm always choosing God. And that's his concern here because he's saying to live the Christian life, that's the, ty that's the type of commitment that it's going to take. It takes that level of devotion and commitment to it. Amen? Have you, ever, have you ever watched someone walk down a path in life that you've already been down? And you can tell they are very naive to what's coming? Because you've already been down the path. So you already know these obstacles. You know the trouble they're going to run into. I'll give you a good example. As a pastor, um, I marry a lot of people. And, and I, I, I've been married now, you know, going on for what, let's see, about 16 years now. And I, so I've been married for a little while, and it's, it's whenever I see, can I just say it's a little bit funny? Okay, I don't mean to be cynical, but it's a little bit funny when I see the, the couple standing before me and they're making the vows, okay? Now, some of you in here I've married, so I know. But I, I know when y'all making those vows, your eyes, I mean tears, on some, some tears are coming down, just killed death do us part in sickness and in health. See, I've already been down that road. I've been down that path. So you go, well, are you making fun of people making vows? Of course not. I mean, maybe a little, but of course not. We all make vows and we mean them, but here's the point. You don't know what you're talking about because you haven't been down that path yet. You have, when you've been married for 20 years, now I want to hear you make those vows again. All right, when there's big trouble in the relationship and actually somebody is sick or there's heartbreak or there's hurts, I want to hear those vows then because that's when they mean something. It doesn't really, I mean, gosh, I know it sounds horrible. It doesn't really mean that much when you're making them and you haven't been married for the first day, right? Okay, but, so, but you know if you've been married and you stayed married and you've walked down that, you know when you hear those vows, you know what they mean. They mean something. And what Paul, you got to understand when we read this, Paul is, is saying this from a place of revelation where he knows what it's like to walk down that path of pursuing wealth. And what he is saying is, he's, he's saying this by the Holy Spirit from a place of revelation with his eyes wide open. He's saying, listen, I know there are many of you that think you can go down this path, but you, you're, what you're thinking is very naive. You think you can pursue this and go after it, and, you can, and it can coexist in your relationship with God. He's saying you don't understand the snares and the traps and the obstacles and the pains and the heartache that's at the end of that. So it's a, it's a warning to us. Why is it, if you've noticed this, you've probably noticed this in your life, why is it that more, having more, does not necessarily lead to contentment or happiness? Why is it that when you get that thing that you've always wanted or that thing you were working for, why is it that when we get it, it doesn't actually make us happy? Have any of you ever experienced this? I mean, just recently I've been having this conversation with my kids because... You know, we make our kids, they do chores, and they work, and they get a little money, and there's certain things in their life that if they want them, they're going to pay for them. You know, they're going to buy them. And so my kids like to collect stuff, you know, and so they'll, right now, for example, my son, I, he's 11, um, he's collecting nutcrackers. You know, I, hey, it's Christmas, maybe, I don't know, but he likes the little soldier guys, he's collecting them. And we were having this conversation recently of why is it that you get your eye on one, and you think, I got to have that. And when you don't have the money, you try to talk dad into it. You know, you try to finagle. You try to do whatever you can do to get it. And you think it's just going to be the greatest thing ever. And you could just imagine it sitting on your shelf. But then as soon as you get it, two days later, you got your eyes on another one. And isn't that just how it is in life? Why is it that when we get more, it doesn't necessarily lead to contentment or happiness? I mean, how many of you in here remember when you first started working and then you got a raise? 
And then you got more, and you started making more. And then you look back at the life where maybe you were making half of what you're making now, and you look back and go, it's nice, but I really don't think I'm any happier than I am now than I was then. But see, here's the reason. Because none of that stuff was ever meant to fulfill you. You weren't designed to be fulfilled by that. You have a place in your heart and in your life as a creation of God, as a son and a daughter of God, that can only be filled by relationship with God. And so when you try to fill it with money and stuff and houses and vacations and cars and boats and everything, what happens? It, it's not that those things are bad, but if you're looking to them to fill that hole, you're always going to be empty. And you could have double what you have now. You could have triple what you have now. And you'll feel exactly as you do today because those things don't affect your happiness in life. You're not, they're not designed to. They can't. But see, that is the trap. That's the trap that Paul was talking about. He's saying it presents itself as uh, the, the, the example that comes to mind, if you've seen that movie Aladdin, and the little monkey goes into the cave and there's like this huge ruby. You know, and he's just like locked in on it and he's already been warned not to touch it. And the, uh, Aladdin's yelling at him, you know, don't take it, don't touch it. But he's locked in now and he can't. He just goes and he grabs a big ruby. That's how we get sometimes. Like we see it and we can we see it before. We just know what it's going to do in our life. We just know how happy it's going to make us. But that's what Paul's telling us. He says it's a trap. It's a trap. Now, you may think I'm talking this morning like I think it's wrong to pursue wealth. I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with you being blessed. I don't think there's anything wrong with you making, making money and having none of that. What, what I believe Paul is concerned about, and when you take the whole counsel of Scripture, what you realize is, no, there's nothing wrong with being blessed. But you see, it's how you go about it, and it's the place that it has in your life. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs that the blessing of the Lord makes rich, but adds no sorrow with it. So in other words, he's comparing, he's saying there is a way to get rich, but it fills your life with sorrow. It fills your life with pain. It fills your life with emptiness. He said there's another way to be blessed, which is by pursuing God and doing it God's way, putting the things of God first and letting him increase you. So you can do it yourself or God can do it. Amen. Amen. There was one psychological study that was done where they looked at 225 research projects that had been done on this very topic, what we're discussing this morning. And they, this is the main question they were after. Does success lead to happiness? These were not, you know, Christian research projects. These were just, you know, regular psychological research projects. They looked at 225 studies that had been done, and they were looking for a pattern. Does being successful, does reaching that goal, does getting to that place in life, does it lead to happiness? Here's what they found. They found that, no, it was the exact opposite. They found that it was the exact opposite, that when happiness preceded success, actually happiness led to people being successful. In other words, if they found happiness first, if they found happiness in their life in their current situation, that those happy people generally produced success in their life. But if you were unhappy before you got the success, then you were unhappy after it, just the same. It made no difference. It might have made difference in the short term, but long term, no difference. So this is actually, I, short of the 225 research projects, we could have told you this from Scripture. Because... That's what Paul means when he says contentment. He's saying with your current situation, find contentment and happiness right where you're at. You go, but I, but I don't like my current situation. I understand. But find happiness and contentment in it, and, and I promise you that will actually end up being your path out of that situation. You know how many times the Bible, in, in the Bible we are specifically commanded with this exact phrase, give thanks? 68 times. And that doesn't include all the other times we're talked about, <clears throat> told to be thankful. But that exact phrase, give thanks, is found 68 times in the Bible. You know how many times you'll find the word complain, or, or the, the command to complain, or to gripe? Not one. Never told to do that. So we're told 68 times in Scripture to give thanks, 
We're never told to gripe or complain, but how many of you know that many of our conversations and many of the words that are coming out of our mouth, it would seem like the Bible told us 68 times to complain and to gripe. But listen, this is what I've learned about, this is what I've learned walking with the Lord. I don't know what it is about this with God, but until you are content in your exact situation that you're in now, until you are content without your circumstances changing at all, until you're content there, God will not move you out of that. Now, you can move yourself out. Don't, don't misunderstand me. You can, by the arm of the flesh, you can change your situation, but I promise you this, you'll regret it. You'll regret it because you'll, you'll do it and you'll be following this trap. And it'll be just what he said in Proverbs, instead of the blessing of the Lord making you rich and not adding sorrow, yeah, you'll change your situation, but there'll be sorrow all added with it. But God has no problem advancing you. But until you are content with your exact situation now, he will not move you to the next, the next phase. Until you can find contentment right where you're at. I've noticed this was God, with God over and over. The moment I found contentment, the moment that I found happiness and couldn't care less whether my situation ever changed or anything around me ever changed, the moment I found happiness, that was right when God said, okay, good, now I can move you ahead. And I've tried to figure that out and think about it, but I think it has to do with this. Because God is training us because he wants us to be content in him. See, because he's with us no matter what our circumstance is, no matter what our financial situation is, no matter what's going on in our life, God is with us. And when, he, when our happiness, he's our source of happiness and joy, we can find contentment right in the middle of wherever we're at. So he doesn't ever want us to find contentment or happiness on our circumstances or on the external things. In, in uh, week one, we looked at in John chapter six where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And this is exactly what I believe he meant. That the bread of life means that he is our source. He is the sustenance of life. In John six thirty two, we read this in week one. But it says, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. What, is he, what does he mean when he says, the one who comes to me is never going to hunger again? It means that you will be satisfied. You will be complete. You will be fulfilled in me because I am the bread of life. Money's not the bread of life. Things are not the bread of life. Status is not the, man, the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. And when we, when we get our focus off and we start trying to draw only what the bread of life can give us, but we start trying to draw it from other stuff, how many know it always leaves us empty and disappointed? No, Jesus is the only bread of life. Amen? Amen. I want to read you. This is part of these studies they were doing on, on wealthy people. I want to read you... Uh, some of the things that they discovered and found. We'll just kind of go through them quickly, but I found this interesting to me. This was from several different studies they did. Um, I'm going to read you some quotes in just a minute. This is from Brooke Harrington, a professor at the Copenhagen Business School who had studied and written about financial practices of the super wealthy. She said, the, the question that rich people ask themselves about their money is not, do I have enough money to buy this expensive thing I want? But rather, do I have as much or more than these people I'm comparing myself with? The sensation of being well off is not about fulfilling a childhood dream of buying a sailboat or something. Feeling wealthy is about comparison with others in your reference group. So the question is not what individuals want to buy, but what they feel they must buy in order to keep up their status. So for many, wealth is just a status. It's, an, it's, an, it's, it's who they want to be in life. It's the status they want to have in life, and that becomes what it all um, is about. But how many of you know we should be getting our status from who we are in Christ? We don't get our status from 
our wealth, what we have or what we don't have. Our status comes from who we are in Christ. And I don't think social media has helped this. I think, you know, you see social media and you see all your friends and uh, they're, you know, driving this, living here, taking this vacation, doing that. And without social media, you wouldn't even have known it. You'd have been happy right where you're at. But then you see it blasted all over social media and you go, well, I should be taking my family there. <laughs> I should be doing that, right? So it doesn't help the, the comparison issue. But this is what I found so uh, interesting. They, in one of these studies, they quoted several different people that were very wealthy. They quoted them. Uh, and here's some of the quotes I found interesting. I wanted to read to you. One guy said, I thought if I could make $10 million, well, that must be too easy. In fact, I honestly thought everyone else had probably already made $11 million. So then I felt poor again. I now needed $100 million to be happy. Another guy said, for me, at least, I can say with absolute certainty that it has not made me any happier. One guy said this about his mother who had, who had attained a great amount of wealth. He said, after she attained what she thought was success, my mother was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. She spent the days up until her death regretting almost all the choices she made and beat herself up day after day. One of her last journal entries included reflections on how unappreciative she was with the things in front of her. And finally realizing happiness does not lie with superficial matters a little too late. Another guy said, after a few months of wealth, you will eventually get used to it and become the same person that you are now. These are not Christian people, but I thought, man, that's very insightful. This one said, having grown up as a child in a family which can be described as old money, and having since then lived in humbling circumstances, I can say for sure that families from old money treat their children like gods. When I was little, I used to take kids aside and explain to them that I was indeed God. Psst, you know I'm God, right? Obviously that feeling has left me now, but it hasn't left my father who used to tell me that we have blue blood. He now sits in his room in constant depression and is the most miserable person I know. So I know these are extreme examples, but the point is it doesn't matter how much money you have, that can't make you happy. Again, I want to emphasize I'm not against you having money. I don't believe God is against you having money. Matter of fact, I believe that God can ordain circumstances in your life as a result of generosity and as a result of being faithful to God that he can he can ordain situations in your life and job opportunities and promotions and things so that you can be blessed and so that you can bless the gospel and you can pursue the things of God and you can be generous to other people I believe God does that and gets involved but you can also do it yourself apart from God and that's the key part that I believe we see in scripture is don't go after that like a God. Just go after God. And when He opens those doors or He provides those things for you and you walk through it, well, then you're just walking in the blessings of God that He's provided for you. Amen? Amen. I want to read this last passage of uh, Scripture in Philippians 4. Paul is writing... And in Philippians 4, verse 11, he says, For I have learned in whatever situation I am in, in to be content. Now, for many of us, we have not learned that lesson. Paul learned it. He said, I learned that whatever situation I'm in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And I believe if we could ask him, he'd say, and I prefer to abound. <laughs> but I know how, I know how to be brought low also. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, and it is this, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, to be honest with you, we've misused this verse for years. People love to quote this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And what we mean a lot of times when we say that is whatever I'm doing at the moment, whatever I'm trying to accomplish, I can do it because God's strengthening me to do it. That's not actually what this verse is saying. 
It's not what this verse is saying. What, what, we've, meant, what, what we've meant by that all, oftentimes is we come up with our own vision and our own goal and our own things that we're trying to accomplish, and then we just want to attach God's name to it. Like, well, God's going to help me do my own thing in my own direction that I'm going in my life. That's not what this passage... This passage is not telling you that any single thing you set your mind to, you can do because God is with you. That's not what this passage is telling you. What this passage is telling you is that in certain times of your life, you might be up, and in other times, you might be down. And whenever that is the case, God's strength will strengthen you to walk through it. And that your joy and your, your enjoyment of life can be constant because you're not drawing your strength from the circumstances. You're not drawing your strength from the money. You're drawing your strength from God. So whether I'm up or whether I'm down in my finances or my job or my circumstances or in my stuff, it doesn't matter because I wasn't drawing my strength from that to begin with. I was drawing my strength from God. So this is the revelation that Paul had, and that's why he said it's the secret. He said, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, it doesn't matter. He said, I can go through either one because it's Christ who strengthened me. In other words, I'm connected to the vine. I'm connected to the true source. I'm connected to the bread of life. And that's where I'm drawing all of my strength, all of my fulfillment is coming from him. So when these circumstances are up and down, it makes no difference. So I'm connected to him. And that is the secret to contentment and to being thankful. Amen? Amen? So this week is Thanksgiving. And I've made it a practice in my life that each week of Thanksgiving, usually on the morning of Thanksgiving, but if not, sometime during the week, I always like to get alone by myself. I like to get a journal. And I just start to list the things in my life that I'm thankful for. And I, I just tell God, God, thank, thank you for this. Thank you for doing this. Thank, and, and just like Paul's saying, there are ups and downs. Every year is not the same. Some years up, some years down. Some, things are, some, some years things are going good, some years not. But when I take that time to just sit down and journal and write all the things I'm thankful for and all that God has done and all the ways he's blessed me and my family, you know what happens? Discontentment just disappears. You know, whatever my eyes had been on, because what it refocuses me on the things that I have to be truly thankful for. And that's the thing about contentment and thankfulness. It, it all is dependent on what you're focusing on. There's negative things that happen in all of our lives. There's, there's bad things that happen in all of our lives, and there's good things. But it has to do with what you are meditating on and what you are thinking about. Some people make a really good habit of just focus. They're so focused on the negative that's happening that they can't see the good things and the blessings that God is doing in their life. Amen? So let's make sure this, this year for Thanksgiving that we're taking that time and we're putting God in the proper place. Let's stand on our feet together this morning.